Welcome. The title of today's notes worksheet is Ellipses Day 2. This lesson represents for us an opportunity to dive a little deeper into some of the algebra there. So we're going to do exactly that and then maybe start to develop the premise for some applications that we'll see on the next notes worksheet. But uh, let's go ahead and get started here. So uh, it's time to expand on what we did on the previous lesson. Yesterday, if you remember what we did is we, we modeled an ellipse on the coordinate plane, both horizontal and vertical, with the center directly at the origin, so the center at 0, 0. The only added element here today is that we're going to go ahead and take our ellipse and move the center off the origin. And so the center is going to be at our h and k. And so the equation is going to stay very similar. That's the key. It's just can we go ahead and work with the numbers when they're not so straightforward when this is not 0 and 0. Okay, so um, you have a couple things here that just that I pasted in to refresh. So here in this case, here's your center, h and k. Remember a couple things as we get started here. From center to vertex is A. So from here to here is A. And by the way, the major axis, there's the 2A, kind of labeled. Center to covertex, that's B. And remember the minor axis, don't forget that piece, everyone. The minor axis is 2B. And in, this one does not have the position of the foci, but center to foci, wherever it may be in here on the major axis, center to foci, or to a focus, I should say, center to a focus is C. All right, and these are the two we're going to see, stretched horizontally, stretched vertically. So let's go get our standard forms here. Of course, these are the big ones. So a little more so than yesterday, because yesterday was just a very defined and limited here because we were going and just putting our center at the origin. But in this case, now this is the one. This is our standard form. So it is still two fractions added together, set to one. That's just the standard form there because it has the information in the problem, specifically the a squared and b squared. Remember, plus is um, the operation in between these two fractions. So theoretically, the order doesn't matter in which I place them. A lot of textbooks and a lot of students like to see that bigger number out in front, but it does not matter. Let's be clear on that. But if it goes horizontal, that just means that the larger number is under the x. And in this case, of course, instead of x squared, just like we saw yesterday, it's x minus h squared. And instead of y squared, it's y minus k squared. So don't forget that piece, and this will come up with all the conics, h always goes with the x, and k always goes with the y. And there it is. As long as the larger number is under the x, you know this is stretched horizontally. And h and k represents the center of your ellipse. Okay, very good. Then obviously we want the vertical piece. I'll do the same thing. Again, two fractions added together and set to one. That way the a and the b are prevalent in the problem. And so let's go ahead and put that. It's nice when we have that. We can use the A and B and probably get our C, which we did yesterday. And in this case, of course, if the larger number is under the Y, then you know it's stretched vertically. But again, K always goes with the Y, and H always goes with the X. That looks great. So don't worry about the order in which these two fractions are placed. Go with the larger number. That's the key. Larger number, whichever letter it is under, that's the stretch. So that's what we'll go ahead and do. Why don't we start that process there? You know, there are just different types. There's um, going with the equation and then seeing if we can look at the ellipse graphically and then, you know, maybe even vice versa. Can we um, take an ellipse and uh, look at the equation, try to come up with that? Anyway, let's go for example one. So I guess the first order of business is to determine the center. And then let's go ahead and get a stretch on this. So H and K, everybody, center of the ellipse. Let's go ahead and put that in place. What do you think the center of the ellipse would be here? Again, it's off the origin, H and K. H goes with the X, so I'm hoping you see it's 3. And this is just like saying Y minus negative 2. So I'm hoping you're all comfortable with 3, negative 2 being the center of the ellipse. And let's go ahead and do this piecemeal here. So 1, 2, 3, down 1, 2. I'm just going to go ahead and put a little X right there. Again, it's not on the ellipse, so I'll just go ahead and at least highlight that center. Good. Now, letter B. 
Is the ellipse stretched horizontally or vertically? And remember, the order doesn't matter, just to focus on the numbers here. And which is the larger of the two numbers? Oh, there it is. So larger of the two numbers. And which letter is it under? And it's under the Y. And so this is going to be stretched vertically. So from, and this is going to be the key, um, what we're going to have to do here is come up with our, our vertices and our covertices and all that stuff. So I might put a couple things on the back burner. I'm just kind of reading this problem the way I worded it. I think I'm going to take C and D and hold off on that just for the time being. And let's do just a little work off to the side to get this going. All right, so what do you say? We've got enough information here. Let's go vertices first. So I've got a lot of room to work. I know I didn't leave you a ton, but see what you can do. Let's go vertices. And as soon as you hear the word vertices, you're thinking A. And A is 5. I hope everybody's cool with that. And basically what we want to go ahead and do is, is figure out where the positions of the vert vertices would be based on going 5 units. The question, of course, becomes do we go up and down to the vertices or left and right to the vertices? And remember, the vertices are in the same direction as the stretch. So that's why we answered this question right here. So we want to go vertical, up and down to the two. So again, let's just count it out here. It's just kind of easy. And then we'll talk about a way if we don't have the opportunity to count it out. But I'm just going to go up five. One, two, three, four, five, and put a point. Please remember, the vertices always come from the center, not necessarily from the origin. I've seen a lot of students do that. From the center. So up five. And then down five, one, two, three, four, and five. And I'll put another one. Now, one thing to note here, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and get just these two ordered pairs here. This looks to be three comma three. So that looks to be one of them. And this one down here looks to be three negative seven. I'm hoping I'm seeing that right. And there would be your two vertices. Now, one thing to note is if the counting is unavailable to us for whatever reason, is there a way to come up with the position of the, the vertices here without counting? And, and yeah, of course. So think about it this way. From the center, look at the center right here. When we move up and down on the coordinate plane, everybody, which coordinate changes, x or y? Well, when we move up or down, you can see that it's the y coordinate that changed. So all you have to do is just add 5 to this, negative 2 plus 5, and subtract 5 from this, and you get negative 7. So that's just an easy way to do that is if, as long as you know the direction, just add your value to either the x coordinate or the y coordinate. Hope that helps. We'll do the same on the cos. So let's go get the covertices. So covertices, if you would. As soon as I hear the word covertices, I'm thinking b. And again, the nice thing about this equation is b is part of it. So b is 4. Because I went up and down to the vertices, we know we're going to go left and right to the covertices. So it's nice to have this visual guide right here. Now, this is not going to be perfect, I see, but let's go one, two, three, four. Let's put a point. So four to the left, one, two, three, and just off there, but whatever, to the right. Okay, good. What would be the position of those covertices? So let's go ahead and get those two pieces. And just, you know, we, we went 4 to the left. What is that ordered pair? Well, it looks to me to be negative 1, negative 2. Hope everyone sees that right there, negative 1, negative 2. And this one seems to be, let's see, we kind of have 2, 4, 6, 7 I'm getting. And that would be 7, negative 2. All right, nice. Now, same deal, what if I was unable to kind of count it out there for whatever reason? Is there a way to come up with these? Sure. Hey, guys, when you move left and right on the coordinate plane, it's the x coordinate that changes. So if I know I'm moving 4 to the left and 4 to the right, very simply, 3 minus 4 is negative 1. 3 plus 4 is 7, and the y coordinate stays the same. Hope that helps. Okay, now let's go get the foci. So. The C value is not part of the equation. You kind of see why I put it in terms of C, just because here we have A squared and B squared right in the equation. So just 
simple to use because now I just have to run a 25 minus 16 down there, and then that can get me going. So I hope you all see this. C squared is going to be 9. You know, I don't know, if you want to do a plus and minus 3, really C is just 3 units. And uh, here's the question now. Are we going up and down to the foci, or are we going left and right to the foci? And if you've been kind of paying attention to the problem here, the foci go in the direction of the vertices, in the direction of the stretch, however we want to say it. So we're going up and down. So what do you say? Let's, let's try this out. Without counting, let's go ahead and get the position of the foci, and then we'll go ahead and put it in place. Good practice. So remember, just which coordinate changes when I go up and down on the coordinate plane? Well, of course, the y's change. So from the center, that's the key, guys, from the center, um, the x is going to stay the same, and I'm just going to add, what is it, add 3 to the y and subtract 3 from the y. So I'm going to get 3, and let's see, add 3 to that, so 3 comma 1, that looks fine by me, and then subtract 3 from the y, so negative 2 minus 3, negative 5. So add 3 to the y, subtract 3 from the y, and that should get us there. So, and again, the counting should bear that out, 1, 2, 3. Here's a focus, one, two, three. Here's a focus, looking great. All right, let's sketch this guy here. Let's see, this one's a little more circular than the one I drew yesterday. Oh boy, not easy for me. Let's see, maybe you can do a better job. Kind of up like that, yeah, still not too bad. Yeah, a little, little off, but that's all right. Hey, humor me if you would, pick a point anywhere you'd like. I'll pick one right here, what the heck. Pick a point and go distance right to a focus. Distance right to a focus. If I added those distances together, I would get a particular number. Would that be the same sum as any other sum from any other point on this ellipse? You bet. The sum is constant, just like we saw yesterday. Okay, that looks beautiful. Let's move on. All right, so this one actually just seems to be sort of a, a repetition, but I think the numbers are a little harder here. So let's see if we can do this without the coordinate plane. And if you need one, be visual with it. I, I would recommend that for sure. But a couple things to note here. If we're going to talk about the location of the foci, the foci are coming off the center. So everyone, if you would, give me the location of the center for this ellipse. And in this case, I'm hoping you would see that it is 4 and negative 5. There's your center. Now, let's go ahead and get us our, our C value. So I do need my foci. And so let's go A squared minus B squared. If you have a calculator handy, you might want to pull that up. I might be able to do a couple things in my head here. Let's just see. So I'm getting a buck 21 minus the 64 here. So C squared is, uh, looks like 57, I'm getting. Confirm that for me if you would. So C is kind of the plus or minus, if you would, but essentially root 57 units. All right. Good. Now here's the key. We're not going to count because I don't have a coordinate plane to count, but could you still give me the locations of uh, the foci here? So here's what I guess I would ask. Are we going from the center? Are we going to the foci left and right or up and down? Remember, the foci are on the major axis, which is in the um, direction of the stretch. So what do you think? Well, it looks like larger number, and again, the order doesn't matter. Larger number, though, is under the x. So this is horizontally stretched. So we would be going to the vertices left and right we would also be going to the foci left and right. We would be going to the covertices, up and down, smaller number under the y. All right, but let's see. Now, guys, watch how this is going to play out. Um, we want to go ahead and find those foci there. I'm going to leave it as just root 57 as an irrational number. And um, here's what we have to ask ourselves. If we go left and right on the coordinate plane, which coordinate is going to change from our center? because I'm coming from the center, and if I'm going left and right, is it the x-coordinate that changes or the y-coordinate that changes? 
And of course, if we move horizontal on a coordinate plane, it's x that's changing. In this case, it's changing by root 57 units. And so I would start at 4, and I would add root 57, wherever that would maybe put us, if we got a decimal approximation. And then the y coordinate would stay the same. Is everyone okay with that? So I would add root 57 to the x, but I would also take away root 57 from the x. And there you go. How's that? Kind of nice. Again, just totally number oriented, no visual. Um, if you need the visual, use it. I would encourage you to kind of leave it like this. If you gave me a decimal, it's not the end of the world. Um, this is a great answer, by the way. Students in past years ha have asked about consolidating this a little bit. Could you do a plus or minus on that? And that's why you know I've kind of been doing a little plus or minus, although I didn't do it there. Could I write this as a more consolidated version of our answer? Sure. Yeah, look at that. It's kind of nice. So 4 plus root 57 uh, minus 5, and then 4 minus the root 57, and that negative 5. Cool. All right, I'm going to box up whatever, this one, I guess. But obviously, this one is correct as well. Nice. Let's keep going forward. Ooh, here we go. So uh, standard form, it's great. All the information is there. The center, the A value, the B value, and we can get the C value. And so all the geometry mixes beautifully with the algebra in standard form. We did kind of talk about all of the conic sections can be written in a different form, what is called the general form. And the general form is very similar in nature for all four conic sections. Here is the one for an ellipse. Notice the only difference between the circle and the ellipse. It's still x squared, still y squared, still x, y, and constant. The only difference is there are numbers out in front of the x squared and y squared. And for it to be an ellipse, those numbers are different. The fact that they're different, just by making them different in front of the squares, stretches the circle and makes it an ellipse. Kind of fascinating. Um, I said the big skill set to this whole unit is completing the square. So complete that square. And just don't forget, as it says on your paper, keep everything in balance, guys. This is going to be a little harder than the circle, so we'll be careful with it. And then don't forget, with that standard form, when you set it to 1, that's where all the good information comes from. So that's where the A comes from, there's the B, and so forth. So set it to 1. Let's go give it a try. What do you say we go 1 all the way through, and then 1 will just convert? So big, deep breath, because look at this bugger right here. This is an interesting one. Let's see if we can make it happen, guys. So first and foremost, we complete the square on the x's. I'm going to take this in two steps. When you get better at this, you'll be able to take it in one. But I'm going to complete the square on the x's. I'm going to complete the square on the y's. And this constant is in the way. It's going to go to the other side. So here is the one dilemma with an ellipse compared to a circle. The circle was ready to go because I, was, I only had my two terms, and there was not a number in front of the x squared. And that's how we complete the square without having that number in front. So I have to remedy this, guys. And so what it comes down to, everyone, is this. I'm going to go ahead and just try to lightly circle these two. And what we're going to want to do is bring out or factor out the number in front of the x squared from those two terms. And when we do that, we get it ready to be completed. So this is what I mean. We're going to take out the 4, and now notice I've got my single x squared, by the way. But if I do take out the 4 from this term, I do want to take the 4 out from this term. That's the key. So it's going to be a minus 2x. Now do you see, guys, it's ready. Two terms, a single x squared, and it's good. So it's going to look just like that. Hold on that for a moment. Make sure it's clicking. So we're going to factor out the number in front of the squared. And we're going to factor it out from both of these terms. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and do this as well. And we're going to take out the 9. So it looks like here's the plus. Let's pull out the 9. And I get y squared minus 6y. Close it off. It was ready. So let's get the blank. Close it off. 
Now, guys, it's all about balance. Keep everything in harmony. So whatever I add to the left-hand side, I must add to the right. Now, I'll bet you are perfectly capable of filling in these two blanks on the left. The trick is the balance. So if you're ready, let's see how you can do here. I'm ready to put the 1 in. So that's what would complete the square right there. I am also ready to put in the 9 right there. And at first glance, a lot of students potentially would say, all right, I added 1, I added 9, that's adding 10 on the left, so I add 10 on the right. Is that correct, everybody? No, absolutely not. Because I didn't actually add 1, what did I add to the left-hand side? I added 4 times 1. Because remember, here's a 4x squared. Here's a minus 8x. Here's a plus 4 officially. So I added 4. And just like here, I didn't add 9. I added 9 times 9. Because this distributes into that to get the full value of what we added. So really, guys, I added 4 in 81, which is 85. And if I add 85 to the left, I add 85 to the right. Okay. Now, uh, we've said this before. The whole reason for completing the square is because of the way it factors, changing that form. So this is x minus 1 times x minus 1. This is y minus 3 times y minus 3. I add these two together, I'm seeing a 36 pop up. Now, these numbers are going to work out nice. Now, notice, take a look, guys. This is very similar to that circle. Look at that piece. That's what's kind of cool about it. The only thing is the circle didn't have these unbalanced numbers in front of the squares, did it? And that's the idea. It's just by putting numbers that are different here and here, it stretches the circle in a particular direction. To see the stretch, though, in which way it's truly stretched, we set it to 1. So let's divide by 36. If you want to do this in three separate fractions, you can do it under here and do it under here. I'm hoping we can shortchange that a little. Okay, well, let's get moving. This is one. That's easy enough. This, two fractions with a plus in between. Now, this is a common denominator to these two fractions. So what you're going to do is very simply reduce. So what is 4 over 36, everyone, if I made you reduce that? 4 over 36 is 1 over 9. So I'd have a 1 times this x minus 1 squared over 9. Good. Now, this one is a denominator to this right up here. So I have a 9 over 36. Can you reduce 9 over 36? Absolutely. It's 1 over 4. So I had a 1 times this over 4. And now we're ready. I'm hoping at this stage we can just let it ride. I think we've got center. We're going to go get vertices. I'm going to even do covertices, even though it doesn't say. And we're going to do foci too. Let's do the whole thing if we can. This looks great. I'm hoping everyone's okay with the conversion. Now all the information is there. So let's go center. And the center is 1, 3. All right, good. Now, which way is this going to stretch, everybody? Look for the larger number. Larger number is the 9, and the 9 happens to be under the x. That's why, everyone, that's the only reason. And so this is a horizontal stretch. So let's go vertices. Keep going here. A is 3. And uh, we're going left and right, right? Left and right, everybody to get those vertices. And when I go left and right on the coordinate plane, which coordinate changes, of course? Is it the x or is it the y? And if I go left and right, it's the x coordinate that's changing. So let's be very clear on that. From the center, from the 1, 3, we're going left 3 and we're going right 3. So guys, if I go left 3, 1 minus 3 is negative 2. So negative 2 comma 3 would do the trick on that. That's looking great. And then the other piece would be adding 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. So 4 comma 3. Good. Let's go get the covertices. Now we're rolling, everyone. Come on, you can do it. You're doing great, I can tell. 
B is 2. Which direction are we going for the covertices? The opposite of the stretch. So we're going up and down. Which coordinate changes when we go up and down? It's the Y coordinate that changes when we go up and down. And so from that center, let's change that Y coordinate by 2. So if I go up 2, I would add 2. So how about 1 and 5? And if I go down 2, I would subtract 2. So how about 1 and 1? Hey, if I'm going too quick, again, pause and kind of rewind it and look at that again. But I'm hoping this piece right in here is, is stuff that you're like, all right, it's, it's all coming together. Foci, it's time to get those foci. So foci, let's go get C. I might have to just come up here running out of a touch of room. C squared is A squared minus B squared. Again, larger number is always the A in the ellipse. So 9 minus 4. So I'm hoping you all see that C squared is going to be 5. So C is, you know, plus or minus, whatever. Root 5. I'll just write it as a root 5, and we'll get our two directions on it. Hey, everyone, left, right, or up, down? And it's left, right. We're stretching horizontally, so you know it's left, right. And without any coordinate plan. This is great. I like this transition. We're just doing math. That's all. It's fairly elementary when you break it down. So um, are we going left and right? Are we changing the X or changing the Y? And I hope you would agree we're changing the X. So to go right, I would add root 5 to the 1. Again, since it's irrational, I'll just leave it like that. And if I'm going to the left, I would subtract root 5 from the 1. And there, guys, they're your winners. Look how wonderful that is. So you see the general form all coming together, all the information we can get, but we have to convert it first. Convert to standard, and it's all for the taking. Nice. Hey, as I said, make a little deal here. What do you say we just do the conversion on letter B, and we won't go through the whole process of center, vertices, co-vertices, and foci? Love for you to kind of pause the video and do this one on your own, see if you get it. I'm going to do it in two steps again, but I would theoretically, if I was to do, and do this myself, I would probably jump right to this step right here. But um, if you can't, don't, don't worry about it. So, you know, collect the X's, uh, collect the Y's, bring the 13 on over. Just careful on that. It should be a negative 13 when it goes over. And then let's make it happen. Ooh, this one's ready to go. I like this. So um, no need to factor anything out here. X squared plus 10X, I put the blank. Then this one right here, everyone, looks like we're going to take out the Y first. And so I get Y squared, careful, minus 2Y, put the blank. Then negative 13, and I put the blank. Nice. As I said, the first two blanks shouldn't be an issue. It's the third blank that needs to be done perfectly. Otherwise, kablooey, it all goes down. So here we go. Um, what do you say, a 25? And how about a 1? It's looking good. But what did I truly add? It looks like not 25 and 1, but 25 and 4, 4 times 1. So 25 and 4 give me 29. And there's the balance. Oh, that looks great. Time to factor, everybody. If I made you factor this, you would all tell me x plus 5 squared. If I made you factor this, you would probably tell me y minus 1 squared. And a negative 13 and 29 gives you the 16. Absolutely great. Again, looks kind of like a circle, except for that 4 out in front. And that's what makes the difference between center and ellipse at this point. Let's divide by 16. Everything gets divided by 16. And so what we want to do here is just kind of reduce. You just have a 1 out in front, so this is, this is great. This just becomes over 16. Now here, again, reduce for me. These numbers are going to work out cleanly for you. I've kind of made sure of that. 4 over 16 reduces very nicely to, to 1 over 4. So 1 over 4. So I have my y minus 1 squared with theoretically a 1 out in front, but over 4, and then equals 1. And that's it. 
By the way, just coincidence that these two are stretched horizontally. Um, there's no rhyme or reason. Just if the larger number ended up under the Y, we would, uh, we would be stretched vertically. But that's good. Again, throw a dot, dot, dot on this. If, could you get the center? Could you get the, all that other stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, let's go get the last piece. So there's one more measurement that we're going to take a look at here. And I'll try to show you from two different vantage points, what I would call a static vantage point, and then a more dynamic one. So what is called the eccentricity of an ellipse. And it is a measurement that very simply, as it says, provides information about the roundness of an ellipse, how circular the ellipse is, and how stretched the ellipse is. And it is calculated by this nice, easy ratio right here. Everyone, if you would, box that up for me. That's perfect. So our eccentricity is just made up of the C value divided by the A value. How nice is that? And take a look here. You can kind of see sort of, we, we talked about this on the previous lesson, is the position of the foci is really what defines the shape of the ellipse. And you can kind of see the closer the foci are to the center, just like this one right over here, the more circular the ellipse is. So you have a very small C value compared to a larger A value. Everyone okay with that description? Whereas this one, if the, the foci are more, how shall I say, are distanced away from that center, they're further away, it stretches the ellipse. So it is uh, more elongated. And you could see in this particular case here that um, the C value very close to the A value. And think what would happen, of course, if you divided sort of a smaller C value over a longer A value, but what would that look like? Well, I guess let's answer this one last question here and maybe it'll make pretty good sense. It says, uh, what are the possible values for the eccentricity of an ellipse? Hey, if it has to be C over A, um, look at C compared to A, C compared to A, and what would be the interval here? Well, I'm hoping you would be in agreement that C is always smaller than A regardless. So you have a smaller number over a larger number. So it means it's always going to be below 1. And because C has to be something bigger than 0, um, it's going to be between 0 and 1. So that's what I have. So there you go. And as you can see, just based on my two drawings right here, if C is closer to 0, that would be this case right here, small c, large a, so e, the eccentricity is small, the more circular. Everyone okay with that? The closer to zero, the more circular the ellipse. The closer to one, and that's what it says here, by the way, the closer to one, the more elongated the ellipse. If you can humor me for about one minute there, you can drop the pencils. I've got my uh, program up, and we'll take a look at this in the future when we do eccentricities of, um, well, we won't really talk parabola, but hyperbolas in particular. Um, let's see. Look, here's what I have. They define it a little differently on this particular program, but, but here's the interval here if you can just follow my lead. Here's an eccentricity of 0. Here's an eccentricity of 1. And notice the eccentricity I can just kind of sweep out here. Notice the closer to 1, the more elongated. And I mean, it's going to make it smaller, but uh, you could see the closer to 0, the more circular. Okay, so again, ignore the fact that it's getting bigger and smaller. It's just a different, um, different definition that's making that happen. But essentially, I'm more concerned about the elongated part and the circular part. Pretty awesome, huh? Again, we'll see this screen again in the near future. All right, let's go get our last one and wrap this on up. Here we go, example four. Find an equation of the ellipse with vertices at 0, plus or minus 8, and eccentricity of um, 1 half. All right, very cool. I'm going to be visual on this one. I think it's helpful. So everyone, if you would, give me a vertex at 0, 8, right up here. Give me a vertex at 0, negative 8, down there. And by the way, because of those two vertices, do you happen to know what the center is? Yeah, I'm hoping you see. I, I kept it easy on this one. Center is 0, 0. There's going to be your H and K. All right, so let's go ahead and throw that into the mix. Now, when we talk about, you know, equations here, I'm just thinking off the cuff, but basically I do want 
you know, my two fractions with a plus in between set to 1. I need A, I need B, you know, and let, let's see what we have. So here's where we have to be a little careful. At first glance, it looks like we have two of these three without blinking. But I think we have, at least for right now, I would say we have only one. And here's the idea. Based on what I have, everybody, do you see that A has to be 8? Let's be very, very clear on that piece. A is 8, no questions asked. Center, vertex, A is 8. Okay, put that in. Now here's the issue at hand. We have our eccentricity, and I'm going to go ahead and write that eccentricity down here. That is one half. Actually, give me one sec. Let me wait on that for just a moment. That eccentricity is a ratio of C to A, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is the C value and the A value. It is just a ratio of C to A. That's the clear thing about it. So when I see that the ratio of the eccentricity is 1 to 2, it doesn't mean that C is 1 and A is 2. Are, are you okay with that premise? What it means is just if I was to take C divided by A, I would get 1 half. But what we needed was the fact that actually the A value is 8. That is defined in this problem. And I guess I would ask you this. Could we then get the C? So this is what I want to focus on right there. And if A is 8, then I'm hoping you see that C has to be 4. The distance from center to focus is 4. 4 over 8 is what gives you the ratio of 1 half. So that's the key, guys. I'm going to write that just down here and then right up here as well. Could I then, of course, go ahead and use my uh, C squared equals A squared minus B squared? You bet. I like this problem a lot because it gets us thinking about numbers and how they work and and all of it coming together, so many different things. So geometry, algebra, great stuff. Here we go. So let's finish this up. C squared is A squared minus B squared. I have A, which is 8, so 8 squared is that. I need B squared, guys. There's no doubt about that. Uh, C is going to be 4, so C squared is 16. I like bringing the b squared over and subtracting that. So b squared equals 64 minus 16. b squared equals 48, which, by the way, is exactly what we needed. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to kind of do dot, dot, dot. b is square root of 48, which just happens to be 4 root 3, if you want to go ahead and put what b is equal to. But that's not necessary. You know, I'm going to write b is square root of 48, which is 4 root 3. But I, I don't care about b. I care about b squared. So let's go for it. Um, A is 8. 64, huh? The B squared, which is what I wanted, we got that. That's 48. You know, we, the, the B was root 48, so B squared is, is 48, no doubt about that. Now let's go ahead and put the appropriate letters. Here's the key. It's great. I've seen a lot of students over the years do this nicely. And then just the last part, be a little uh, lazy on it. So careful. Um, which direction are we stretching here, everybody? Vertical. So the larger number goes under the y. So y minus k squared, which would be y minus 0 squared, which is y squared. And then, of course, this has to be x minus 0 squared or just x squared. And I think that's our winner. Wow, take a look at that. That's a great one. Eccentricity would be 1 half. And again, it's just a measurement talking about the roundness of uh, an ellipse. Hey, let's wrap that up at this point here. Some good, good algebra to deal with. Um, please get the practice on it, and let me know if anything can be clarified. Thanks for listening, and you'll do great on this.